Uh, Niyami Jaha Eccles um, is a, lives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. She's the founder of something that Niambi too pointed out, the Butterfly Network, which is an empowerment, um, national um, empowerment network, uh, predominantly for African-American young women. Uh, she's a recent author of What Color Is Your Soul, um, in which she talks about the um, sort of the deeper hidden meaning of racism and how we can overcome it. And anyway, I'm delighted to um, consider her my colleague and my friend. And uh, welcome, Niambi. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for um, all of these wonderful beings that have come from all over the planet to be here and share space with us today. Um, I'm truly honored. You know, whenever I do any kind of group, I know that whoever is here is supposed to be here. And no matter how big or small that they're is um, divine connection um, that runs through us all. And so when I um, thought about the topic of interrupting fear and the reason that I wanted to interrupt our fear is that even if you're not personally in fear, fear is in the air. <laughs> it is in the collective air. And, um, and as the numbers rise, um, if, you're, if you're looking at the news and you see the numbers rising of casualties and people who are leaving the planet, um, it could be very disarming because it, it puts us all in a state of collective, collective trauma. Um, it feels like on a much bigger scale what happened when we were um, experiencing 9-11 and when the Twin Towers um, were hit. And you know, we can almost remember where we were when it happened and how it just changed our world. It changed how we traveled. It changed so many things. And I think that this is a much, that was maybe a precursor um, because what we're experiencing right now is a collective trauma um, that's in the air um, and that's bringing about profound grief and loss and panic over our, you know, livelihoods, you know, we don't know how we're going to live and what, what it's going to look like or, you know, um, and, and there are people that are literally just trying to survive um, poverty right now and, and uh, escape death. And because we're all connected, um, even if we're not feeling those things, if we're insulated in some way and we're not feeling the burn of those things, it's in the air. And just as what COVID has taught us is that we are all interconnected. That's something as far as way as, as in China can affect us intimately because we are all just interconnected in, in, in such a profound way. And so when we're interconnected in that way, what happens is that fear, it triggers our trauma. It, it re-triggers um, mental health issues for many um, because what we considered normal has been turned upside down. Um, and I liken it to being in the eye of, a, of, of a, a hurricane or a tornado where you, you know, everything is just upended. And the only space when you're in a tornado or hurricane that is not experiencing the chaos is in the eye. And so um, what I'm hoping is that we can lift our vibration enough to our consciousness to be in the eye of this pandemic. Um, and, and that way we can um, kind of have a different perspective on what's happening um, and, and that. And I have prepared some slides, but I, I really rather just talk. And if you want these prompts, cause they're not fancy slides, so don't get all excited. <laughs> but I will um, be more than happy to share them with you just to prompt your remembrance after this. Um, but I'd like to just keep moving. But I, I think first and foremost, uh, in order for us to move to a different space of understanding and understanding is to acknowledge the transitions. Um, part of what's creating the biggest panic right now is the fact that souls are leaving the planet. 
And because we couch that in the terms of loss, you know, when you turn on the news, um, they talk about the lives lost. And on a human perspective, that is truth. But if we get in the eye of the tornado, we know that nothing is lost, that we are basically souls. And so uh, even though we, we may, um, so when we speak of people being lost, that negates their continued presence in our lives. You know, we don't meet, make space for them to be a continual presence and, and, and also for us to, to continue. So just reframing the thought of loss versus transitioned, because I hate to tell you, there's no way to get in and out of this planet except through death. You know, we're all going to have to go through that door. There, I, I have not found anybody that, um, there was one instance in the Bible, I think, where um, he just, was it Enoch, just walked away with God, <laughs> didn't have to go through death. <laughs> but for us, for the rest of us, I think that that's something that we have to um, come into terms with, that death is not real. It is, it is because we are souls. And, and so if we live our lives trying to escape death, um, it's, it's mute because it's, it's inevitable for all of us. Um, but the duality of that is that we are souls with a physical body that will die, that will, you know, leave this, will turn back to ashes. And so there is this, this, um, duality that we have to live in. We're spirits, but we're also on this physical plane. Um, and, and so that can create all kinds of discomfort in, in the reality of, of letting go of, of what this body means to us and, and how much it means to us. Um, what I do know about this pandemic, um, COVID-19 is, I think, uh, a reflection of who we are. Um, and it is, um, it, it puts everything in perspective because it is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't care if you're white, black, old, young, what's your nationality. It is a global pandemic. And it is something that we've never seen. We've never been this, um, I guess, faced with one, our mortality, but also our connectedness um, in such a way that the whole planet is the human family is dealing with this. The rest of mother nature is moving on. The birds are singing and, you know, they making babies in the zoos. <laughs> you know, and one, I think it was in Ohio where um, they had these two pandas and they had been trying to get them to mate for 10 years. And now <laughs> they're finally mating now that nobody's around. You know? <laughs> so, so life is, is going on. And, and, um, we are the ones that are in crisis because um, the fear uh, uh, that that life is not going to be what we remember it to be. Um, and I think the fear also feeds our lack of understanding and um, that we are spiritual beings. You know, we get caught up in the physical, the physicality of everything. Um, and, you know, because it's really interesting, like when this first happened, um, I, I think this speaks to just my psychology um, brain here. Um, the first thing that was a shortage here in America, I don't know if it was in Belize, but was toilet paper, you know, <laughs> and which is really interesting because it's not um, a necessity for survival. But I think it's really symbolic of all of the crap that we knew that we were going to have to face. <laughs> and eliminate from our bodies and our minds and our emotions um, in that state, you know? So we, everybody's rushing for the toilet paper. And I think on a spiritual level, that's why we, we did that because we know that there is some, some stuff that we need to eliminate. <laughs> so it's really interesting that, um, you know, I was thinking, I was talking to my husband the other day, is like when we come out of this, um, when you go to, you know, you, when you go to um, someone for housewarming or anything like that, you usually bring a gift and the, the gift before COVID was wine. And I think now we'll be bringing toilet paper. 
that'll be the gift that everybody, oh, wow, you brought toilet paper. This is wonderful. So, <laughs> so, but I think too, the other thing that this, this, um, this pandemic is showing us is that, you know, when you have, when you're physical and, and, and Melanie, you spoke to this earlier about, you know, your physical immune system and when it's weak, um, you know, we cover our noses and our mouths with a mask. Um, and then, but now what, what's happening with this is that we are having to look at our emotional and our spiritual immune systems. And um, because when they are weak, then we cover up our hearts and our, and our, um, and our minds because we feel vulnerable. And so um, I think what this pandemic on a spiritual level is allowing us the opportunity to really check in with our emotional and our spiritual immune systems and how, you know, how girded up are we for that? You know, um, I've, I've, I've heard it likened and I've likened this to um, a timeout. You know, some people say we're in a spiritual timeout and I don't believe we're in a spiritual timeout. I believe we're in a physical timeout and that, um, that physical time out, you know, just like when you have a child and you put them in the corner and, you know, for time out, because there's some behavior that's, that's out of order and they go into time out. And part of the, the thought around putting them in time out is so that they can become back into alignment with what's true and, and back and, and, and come to some greater understanding or understanding to change the behavior. Um, and so for us, we're in this physical timeout. Um, and irregardless of how you think we got here, you know, there's a, a plethora of, of conspiracy theories of, uh, about how we got here and why we're here. And to me, it doesn't matter. We're here. We're in the, we're in the corner. <laughs> so how we come out of this, um, you know, what will be, will we be the same when we come out of this, this, this spiritual, this, this physical timeout or, um, and it's, and a timeout is only beneficial if you learn something in the silence. Um, and if we haven't learned anything, then we may find ourselves back in the in time out again um, at some place. Because again, the rest of the only thing that's broken down is our man-made world. You know, everything else is functioning. The waters are clearing up. The sky, Los, Los Angeles didn't even know they could see the skyline. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, everything is, we, we are the ones that are, that are out of order. And so my desire is not to get back to normal, um, but to rather uh, come out of this with a new way of seeing and a new way of being. Um, so I, I've, I've said a lot, but I, you know, I would love for this to be, if you have any thoughts about anything that I've said so far, um, I would love to hear your comments and then we can move on. Anybody have any Anything they want to add to that or say? Amen. Uh, this is Lori. I would like to say something. I'm very much in tune with what you've already shared. I, I have felt deeply that this is um, a spiritual time and that it's called upon us to learn something. It's a learning time. And in the Jungian sense, we're in the collective unconscious and a darkness place, which is a balancing. It's a balancing because the world desperately needed balancing. There is some, some that say COVID-19 is us. It's us. And all of the uh, all of the imbalance that we have been pouring into the world, whether it's the smog over Los Angeles or whether it's the poverty that we've less neglected. It's also the term in 
in a Jungian way is the umbra munda, not the anima munda. So it's a shadow. And if it's a shadow time, it calls upon us to be in it, not to deny it, not to ignore it. And yes, it's fearful, appropriately fearful. Mm-hmm. But it's a time that calls us to go deep. Mm-hmm. Not easily done and not easily shared. And I'll just leave it at that. And thank you for your opening remarks. Yes. And I agree totally with everything that you said. Thank you for adding to my mm-hmm. to that paragraph around that because I think that that is um, very uh, appropriate right now is that we, you know, we always ask the question, what is the matter? What is the matter? And we are the matter. You know, we are the energy. We are the matter <laughs> mm-hmm. that is creating this um, because our matter is connected. You know, our, our, our matter, our energetic matter is connected. So we are the matter. And if we can wrap our minds around the fact that we are all interconnected, you know, that's one thing that COVID has has shown us that we are connected. You know, we are not on separate, you know, planes that that what happens to you, whether you um, take care of yourself affects me. I can't just be worried about um, myself in this. It shows how globally we are all connected. And so I think that what I'd like to kind of frame this around is the stages of um, the seven stages of grief, because I think we're all in, in some aspect of grief around if it's just the grief of not being in our normal um, life as it was. Now, some of us moved from stage, you know, the first stage to seven very quickly um, because we were able to get ourselves right into the the eye of the storm and to, you know, just kind of rest in that space. And maybe our life experience has taught us that when, you know, danger happens, you go straight to the eye, you know, you go straight to, to where it's calm and peaceful. But for many of us, it's taken a process of getting to those seven, through those seven stages. And so I just like to kind of remind us of what those stages are um, as we see our fellow human beings and even ourselves floating through these stages. And the first stage of, of grief is, is shock and denial. You know, it's that, just the shock that what, we, we can't go outside? And the shock, which is really ironic because the old system that we are yearning for wasn't working. (laughs) It just wasn't working. There were so many systems that were broken. Um, And and I liken it to being in an abusive relationship. You know, it's like um, sometimes when you're in, people stay in toxic relationships because they're more comfortable. You know, it's like they're saying you'd be more comfortable with the devil you know than the devil you don't know. So we're going to stay in this relationship. But Um, We have an opportunity to reset um, because we can, in this pandemic, in this timeout, in this dark um, part, um, we can have the opportunity to either reset, be in it long enough, just like in an abusive relationship. If you separate the person from the abuser or the abusive behavior long enough, then they can come to a different understanding. And so part of maybe us being separated in a sense will give us enough space to see who we are so that then we can create a newly formed sense of self because people are fighting to keep the system exactly the way it was. And it wasn't working even for the majority of the people, Um, you know, but the trauma happens when are we when we're resistant to letting go of the ideal of what we believe we were and i think that's a big issue for americans is that we like the idea of who we are rather than the reality of who we are that's why we still have this disconnect around the reality of of slavery of 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 our what has happened to our native american brothers and sisters 
um, is because we like the story of who we are rather than the reality of who we are. And so that the, once we're 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 in this space now, we're having to we're in shock and denial that you know this is and looking for every other reason of this can't be a spiritual timeout. This this has to be something else, and we look for all of these conspiracies of you know who's doing it and what. But to me, it doesn't matter because we're in it, and and um, I, I I I'm a spiritual being, and I know that whatever's happening on this planet to me there is a source that's bigger than all of that, that I have to rely on. That's not sleep on the job, that there's, there's a bigger purpose to this. And just like when you're, when a child is in timeout, they don't understand all of the perspective of the parent or, or the teacher who puts them in timeout. Um, but there's a bigger purpose and there's a bigger lesson. And so, so for many people, there is um, this shock and denial, this first step. Um, but I, I would like to caution us that as dark as it seems that this is temporal, that don't make any permanent decisions in this temporary space. Um, because, you know, uh, uh, that's what happens to sometimes people get stuck in that denial and then they, they can't move forward. And so anything that looks different, they just cannot wrap their heads around that this, we are not going to go back to the world as it was. It just, we're, we're too deep in. And so if we could just reckon, let go of the fantasy of the world that we believe we're letting go and make room for something new. I don't know if that's resonating with you, but that, that you know, I, I, I see you nodding over there, Bill. Did you have a comment? I, I totally agree with you. That's why I was nodding. I mean, that's, that to me is what it's all about. And I, I, that is the great hope, you know, that we will get out of this uh, belief in the ideal of who we are and start to face the reality. I mean, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's, and that's where we, that's where we are. And so then the second stage is, of course, pain and guilt. You know, it's that, that, that stage of the, the, you know, just overwhelmed in the fact that um, that's where we come into a space of uh, the shoulda, coulda, woulda, and, and I wish I had done this, and I wish I had done this. I wish I had, you know, become vegan when it was, you know, when I was trying to, I wish I had drank more water. I wish I had, you know, uh, got rid of some of these sugar addictions. I, you know, for me, I wish I had um, gotten my mother down here with me before um, all of this happened and I could, you know, kind of shield her and her. Um, so there's some pain and there's some guilt that, you know, this is, I can't do what I, what I wanted to. So there's, people who are grappling with the pain and the guilt around um, the shoulds and the could have, and, you know, you know, why did I buy all that toilet paper when I don't have food? You know, <laughs> so, you know, just all of those things that, that, that happen, you're in that stage. And then the third one is anger and bargaining. And I think we see that happening right now in Michigan where there's protests and people are, you know, protesting. We need to get back to work. We need to get back to life as we need to get back to the thriving economy the way, and it's not going to happen like that. And so you're in that anger of, you know, I, I really want things to go back to the way they were. And this to me is the most pivotal stage because it's indicative. It gives us an opportunity to do hard work. Um, and hard work is difficult because it requires us to feel. And we really don't want to feel um, because, and so we stay in anger and denial because we don't want to feel. We don't want to feel and, 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 and understand that we are um, responsible for what's happening, that we, we've all played a part in this. In, in what's happened because we are we are the matter we are all interconnected and so that anger and and, and bargaining and 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 um, that difficulty is 
is important because that step gives us where is the angst? Where, where am I harboring? You know, if we check in with our physical body, where am I holding energy that's, that's not congruent? Um, you know, so even in that self scan, what am I feeling? And, and why am I, you know, why am I feeling this? And, and, and is it my energy or have I picked up the energy of that's in the air? That, it, that I've exposed myself to the fear that's in the air. So it's not really my anger, but I'm channeling the anger of, you know, you watch the news, it, it'll get you channeling all kinds of perspectives, depending on what network you tune into. So then the fourth stage is then goes into this depression, reflection, and loneliness, where we, where we are, where many people are right now. They're, they're um, feeling the 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 pains of um, social distancing and the depression and the stories around that I'm alone and the the truth is is that th this gives us an opportunity to be with ourselves rather than by ourselves um, that that isolation is either we could feel isolated or insulated you know that this gives us an opportunity to to kind of reframe that away in a way but depression is real and mental health is is real and there are people who are struggling because they have forgotten that they are eternal beings they have forgotten that energy cannot be destroyed um, they have forgotten who they are and so i think we all get spiritual amnesia where we forget that we are eternal beings having a physical experience that even when this is said and done, that we get to go home, you know, and, and we're here, but for a minute. Um, I like the analogy of, and I was, I was, didn't know if I wanted to had time to share this, but I know we all have are familiar with the wizard of Oz, right? Uh, not if you, if you know the movie, right? So, the Wizard of Oz, you know, Dorothy gets caught up in this tornado, right? And she, you know, but before the, the, the important part of that is before the tornado happened, in the beginning of the movie, she was in this wishful place somewhere over the rainbow, you know, remember that song? And she was wishing for this other experience, this other world happening. She was, she was yearning for that. And then the tornado happened. And she got caught up in it, and when it when it um, when it landed, when she landed in Oz, it was a whole new reality that was spurned on by this this tornado um, that happened in her life. But her whole um, what she did throughout that movie was try to get back home, and she allowed herself to never lose the the vision that this, the place that she was at was not her eternal space, but she, she knew that she had a home, that that's what she was working towards. Now, there's so many different analogies that I can um, pull from that. That would be a whole nother um, session just on that and, and, and the analogy with uh, COVID-19, because I think Glenda the Good Witch, you know, the fact that there was this bigger presence that was always um, present for her, and it didn't mean that she would not have to go through difficulties. It was just the presence that was there to support her through all of that. And the most scariest thing was the flying monkeys. You know, let's just try to get away from the flying monkeys and, and, and all that that had to, to do. But she made connections along the way. But she also always, the, the yearning was to get back home. And I think that even when she got back home, it was all a dream you know it was all a dream and i think you know we we've heard songs life is but a dream and that this isn't real that this is an illusion that that this is i think when we go to sleep this is just the truth according to niambi i think when we go to sleep we go back home we go visit our loved ones we get information we are we're more in tune with who we are when we are in our sleeping state and so sometimes the gift of depression and and is that it makes you want to sleep and i think part of the the spiritual part of that if we can forgive ourselves for being human 
is that we really, there is benefit to sleep because we get to go back home. We get to get information that we normally wouldn't get in our waking hours. Um, but again, that, and that's some seasons. Sometimes, you know, when you go into depression, all you want to do is sleep. And there's a lot of judgment around that, that, you know, oh, you should be doing something else and rather than get back into the world. When maybe on a spiritual plane, that sleep is reviving your spirit in some way. Um, so in any stage of grief, it's like you can't stay there. But every, every part of that has a purpose if we allow it to have it on a spiritual plane. So if someone is going through depression, it's a time, it could be a time of reflection. Um, and you're never alone because you're connected to everything that is. It's the law of oneness. We are all connected. So, so that's the fourth stage. And then the fifth stage is that that's when that we kind of get this upward turn um, and, and we begin to see kind of the light, at the, a glimmer of a light um, in the tunnel. And it could be just something um, very minor. For some people, the upward turn was when they heard that they were getting a stimulus check. You know, it's like, oh, there's, there's, <laughs> there's going to be something, you know, coming, even if they never got it. You know, it's, there's, there's hope that, that the powers that be care enough that, that we're, they know we're, there's some empathy somewhere that we're not in this alone. Um, and I think that that's where, the, where a big shift can happen is that when we realize that what if this is um, truly an answer to our prayers? What if we prayed for this? What if we prayed collectively that, you know, the waters are polluted and the environmental stuff is happening? We need something to happen different. We need something. Please hear our prayers. We can't keep living in this fractured um, world where we are just um, focusing on the color of our skin and our cultural differences. We need something big to happen that's going to shake us up and bring us all together. What if this is actually an answer to our prayers, our collective prayers? And I was like, I didn't pray for COVID. Well, you prayed for change. And so change happens in a way that we least expected. But if we hang in there, we know that we can get to the other side of there is always a gift in it. So then the sixth um, stage of, of, um, of grief is re reconstruction and working through it. You know, it's that um, what Lori was talking about, that deep shadow work. Um, it's, it's having an opportunity to reset, you know, um, and, and our job is, is while we're in this time out, this physical time out, we have an opportunity to, to reset our, to heal our memories, our cellular, ancestral, our intellectual, our emotional, um, our emotions, because, um, that's where the stories are that keep us trapped in pain and separation. It's on a cellular level that we need to shift those stories. So in that reconstruction and working through phase, it's an opportunity for us to really look within and to see um, what, what are we doing uh, while we're sheltering in place? Um, what are we doing for self-care? What are we doing for community care? Um, shifting our thoughts from productivity to creativity, from doing to being, you know, how do we make that shift of that, that consciousness of building our, our emotional and spiritual immune system? You know, we know that physically taking garlic and ginger and all of the, but what are those practices that we can do um, to build our emotional and spiritual immune system? so that we are not subject to fear um, and to kind of gird us. But, you know, and, and we know that when we shift for ourselves, when I am taking care of my physical body and becoming healthy, I help you because you're less likely to catch something from me if I'm taking care of me. So the most loving act that I can do 
as a physical human being is to take care of myself. The most loving thing that I can do for as a spiritual being is to take care of my spiritual self so that I do no harm, that I can model for you and support you in being the best that you can be and, and working through and helping you work through those spirit, those emotional um, pitfalls and places where we are, we're stuck, that stuck energy. Um, and then move into the last um, phase, which is <laughs> acceptance and hope. And, um, and, and in that phase, for me, it means getting ourselves, that's, that's, for me, it's, it's getting into that, that eye of the tornado or the storm. It's getting into the eye, you know, that a lot of our collective prayers is, oh, let this be over. Let... And mine, honestly, is thy will be done. Thy will be done. Because if I can move into a space where I am in congruence with divine will, then there is no angst. There is no angst. Um, and so, what is keeping me from being in re right relationship with divine source? What is keeping me in, in, um, from being in, in right relationship with myself, being congruent, and then with, humani with humankind and the planet? You know, what, what part of this, because again, the planet is fine. She is, she's taking care of herself. She's, she's doing well. She's thriving. But what part of that is got me out of divine will that I have to have be in time out as a collective. Um, and so how can I get back into divine will that thy will be done, not my will, but the bigger plan of this so that I can be in congruence, so that I can be in the calm in the middle of the storm. Um, I think that how we do that is that we, we have to, to work for and, and, and in that acceptance and hope stage is work from a vision and not from fear. That we have to, uh, um, we, we can't always just be against something. <laughs> I think that that's, but if we became more visibly, emphatically, clearly heading for something, you know, because fear and anger, they push us, they push us, but our vision pulls us. It pulls us. And so we have an opportunity to envision, to pull out a new world, kind of like what, what you're saying in Belize of, of creating a new reality. Uh, what could this look like for us? And, and it's going to take us um, emerging with new values and a new sense of, of who we are and how we're connected. Um, and it's going to take a tremendous amount of love. Um, you know, we, we um, are very familiar because we say it all the time. It's become almost cliche, you know, when people say, talk about fear and what is fear. And we made an acronym. Fear is false evidence appearing real. And we, you know, say that. And then some people say, well, it's, you know, face everything and rise. But I think we're still giving energy to fear. You know, we give it an acronym. We give it, you know, space to be in, in presence. And so we need to create that same kind of acronym for love, which is the opposite of fear. And an acronym of love could be letting our vibration elevate. If we chose to love and let our vibration elevate, and that elevation brings us to the point of divine will, you know, how do we lift ourselves to the space where we are uh, in love and not fear? And it's a choice because we're down here on this planet, which is a free will zone. You know, it, it, it's, we're on a planet of duality that, um, you know, there, there's, you know, I say all the time, if you incarnated here on earth, you know, this is, this is the big boy planet. Don't be coming here scared because this is some real stuff going on here you get to experience some real duality here on this earth school in this earth school so it's like what do we want to experience we know the world that we don't want to experience we've, we've experienced that so how do we envision something new 
where people are feeling connected, where nobody feels left out of this equation, where everyone feels included in a sacred way on a network. How about that? <laughs> Creating a network, but uh, where we all feel included in that. So we, we have an opportunity to emerge from this um, very differently. You know, as, as uh, Angelo said, I, I have an affinity with butterflies. I created a whole organization around the analogy of butterflies because I think that it's so important um, and, and the analogy doesn't break down anywhere for me as far as if anybody that's wanting, serious about transformation, um, that, you know, this, this opportunity right now gives us a chrysalis opportunity to reset. And it's perfect because just like a caterpillar, you know, when a caterpillar decides or that it is tired of, first of all, most caterpillars probably can't even imagine the reality of what being a butterfly is. Um, if I give them human emotions, um, I would imagine if every caterpillar knew that on the other side of, of uh, the death of it would be this wonderful ability to see the world and experience the world in a, in a magical and a, a very different way. So as a caterpillar, it's, it's, you know, it's just slothing around on the ground and, and, and its only job is to eat. So it's gathering all of this food, this, this information, these experiences, it's, it's gathering experiences. And then when it goes into the chrysalis, first of all, it has to build its own chrysalis out of the stuff that it's made out of. And so in that, it goes into this self-imposed shadow or dark space. Um, and its only job is to surrender, is to surrender. Because everything that caterpillar needs to become a butterfly is already in it. All of those experiences are repurposed, recalibrated, recycled, um, to create something new, but it has to surrender, surrender to the point of liquefaction. Now that's some deep surrender, where you surrender to the point of liquefaction. <laughs> um, and so that may mean tears, that may mean just letting go of who I think I am to become who I really am, to let go of the story of humanity to create a different story, um, to create to to let go of just my being so enthralled in my humanness that I can allow myself to go beyond or go deeper beyond the fear um, to a space where flesh is no longer the focus, but rather my spirit. Um, and then that's how I can tap into that I, I can tap into the, the will be done, that I'm not in angst because I know that all is well. And so in that chrysalis, I think that we're all in our own um, chrysalises right now, that how we will emerge, how will we emerge from this? Um, some, some caterpillars don't make it out of the chrysalis. Um, some caterpillars, if they're too dependent on others um, and looking for outside support, they, they're crippled in some way because it, 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 part of, of the work is that you got to do your own work. I can't do that work for you because that, that struggle is important. And I think that as humans, we're always looking for non-struggle. You know, we, we, even in love, we guard our hearts because we don't want to be hurt. So we build walls around our heart because we don't want to be hurt. When being hurt is part of being vulnerable, is part of love. And you can't be in love or have and experience love if you don't allow yourself to be vulnerable. And so I think that, that that's a tremendous opportunity that, that we have faith while we're in the chrysalis, <laughs> that faith that, that we're going to come out of this in a different form. We may look different. We're going to have to learn a new language, probably a heart language for, with each other. Um, and if we know that, if we know the whole story, 
then I don't think we would be so scared of the scary parts of the story. If we understood the whole story, you know, it's just like reading a novel. If you come in in the middle of a movie and it's this just crazy part of the story, it can be frightening. But if you know the whole story, then you know that it, everything's going to turn out in the end. And I think that that's what we have to hold on to. And also our sense of humor. You know, it's like they always say that, you know, everything has the potential to be funny in 100 years. You know, so <laughs> at some point, this we'll be able to look back on this and see the lessons and, and find our, our humor in it. Um, but, but my prayer is that we can um, be in alignment with the divine will and whatever it takes for us to get to that space. So I've said a lot and I want to have space for, um, and Angelo, you might want to um, pause it or end it so that people can maybe speak freely about how they're feeling in this.